does the location of our lesions affect what symptoms we get? Hmm, good question. I recently had a comment from a viewer on this topic, and it piqued my interest, so I thought it might interest you too. The short answer is yes, but I wanted to dive a bit deeper to see what the experts say. I'll also share some information on diet tips to help keep our central nervous systems as healthy as possible and to reduce symptoms, because this channel is all about living well with our MS or chronic illness. Big, huge, giant disclaimer before we get started. I am not a doctor. I'm a girl with MS who shares information on the geeky research that I read and my own experiences on how I've been living well with MS for nearly two decades. If you have any questions at all about your symptoms, please, please ask your MS neurologist or MS nurse, okay? I'm going to do a high-level, research-cited overview of lesion location and typical symptoms. I'll also put all the papers that I cite today in the description below. I'm also going to refer you to two of my favorite neurologists. Yes, I have favorites. And videos that they've done on this topic where they dive a bit deeper into lesions, their locations, and the symptoms that they may cause because they're doctors and they are a lot smarter than me. Dr. Brandon Bieber from California, who posts videos every Tuesday morning, he's one of my favorite geeky indulgences. And Dr. Aaron Boster from Ohio, who posts videos on Mondays and does a live stream once a month on Saturdays. I will put links to both of these videos in the description below. I'm also one of the moderators for the Saturday morning live streams with Dr. Boster, so come join us and say hi. They typically happen on the third Saturday of the month at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and he answers viewers' questions. Subscribe to his channel and his newsletter to be notified when he does the live streams. Okay, let's get into it. In this article from January of 2024, which I will link below, they say this about MS brain lesions. Not all brain lesions are necessarily due to MS, but research shows that certain lesions are particularly characteristic of the condition. Periventricular lesions are white matter lesions in direct contact with the brain's lateral ventricles. The lateral ventricles are two large cavities that contain cerebrospinal fluid. Doctors may refer to white matter lesions perpendicular to the corpus callosum as Dawson's fingers lesions. The corpus callosum is a bundle of nerve fibers that connects the left and right brain hemispheres. Juxtacortical lesions are in direct contact with the brain's cortex. This is the outermost layer of the brain. It goes on to say that there can be lesions in the cerebellum, optic nerve, and spinal cord. Okay, so let's break these down a bit. Periventricular lesions are lesions that form peri, or around the brain ventricles, the fluid-filled areas of the brain shown here in blue. When we get lesions here, we could experience impaired cognition and executive function, numbness or other abnormal sensations, problems related to movement such as difficulty walking, or fatigue. I say could because sometimes we don't get symptoms. Our brains have a lot of reserve, and we may get a lesion in an area that's not critical, or our bodies may work around the damage done by the lesion. It uses the reserve. It goes around the damage. Okay, on to the corpus callosum lesions. The corpus callosum is in the center of the brain, and it's a thick bundle of nerves that connects the two sides together and allows the sides to communicate. It's shown here in yellow with the red arrow pointing to it. Some of the symptoms that we may get from lesions in this area could be confusion, ataxia, which could be difficulty walking, tremors, difficulty with fine motor skills, slurred speech, difficulty with eye movements, or poor balance, dysarthia, difficulties with speech, seizures, headaches, hemiparesis, weakness on one side of the body, or increased muscle tone, spasticity. Next, the article mentions juxtacortical lesions. These could also include cortical lesions. Cortical means the outermost layer of the brain or the cortex, shown here in the darker tan or light brown. These lesions appear in the outermost layer of our brains. Lesions in these areas could cause cognitive and memory impairment, depression, fatigue, weakness, or numbness. Next is the cerebellum. It's part of the back of the brain. It's sometimes referred to as the little brain, and it's shown here in orange. Lesions in this area could cause double vision, swallowing difficulty, weakness or unusual sensations in the face, impaired balance, or coordination. Next is the optic nerve. 
Lesions in the optic nerve are often the first sign someone has MS. The optic nerves are part of our central nervous system and connect our eyes to our brain. They're seen here in yellow. When we get a lesion on this nerve, it can cause vision problems like blurry vision, loss of vision, or painful eye movements. Finally, we have the spinal cord. This is the cord that runs from our brain down our spine and it delivers messages to the rest of our body. Because it doesn't have a lot of reserve like the brain, when we get a lesion on our spine, we know it. It shows up as symptoms really quickly. A lot of neurologists don't do spinal MRIs as part of our regular exams because if there's a lesion there, it will be acute and noticeable fast. It could cause muscle weakness or stiffness, trouble with coordination and balance, pain, tingling, or unusual sensations such as low meat sign, sexual dysfunction, bladder, or bowel problems. That's a lot of symptoms, and that's just a high-level overview. MS can cause all kinds of symptoms. Let me know in the comments below some of your strangest MS symptoms. There's a lot that we can do to help manage our symptoms from these lesions and possibly prevent progression. First is to work with our neurologist on the best disease-modifying treatment for us to slow down our MS and medications that may help with some of these symptoms. Next is diet and lifestyle changes. I'm going to share some tips from a highly respected researcher and neuroscientist, Dr. Lisa Mascani. She wrote an amazing book called Brain Food that I will link below too if you'd like to check it out. Overall, she recommends a diet similar to the Mediterranean diet, but she also includes options for those that are plant-based eaters in her book. A Mediterranean diet is very plant-based and whole food-based. It rarely has processed or packaged foods. Next, she recommends drinking water. It is so important because we need it for energy production and because it carries oxygen. It's particularly important to drink enough water as we get older because dehydration has been shown to accelerate brain shrinkage as we age. Drinking 8 to 10 cups of water per day can boost our brain's performance by almost 30%. Did you know that as our brains shrink, it can cause our symptoms to increase? Yup. Check out Dr. Boster's video on the leaky pool theory. Next is PUFAs, polyunsaturated fats mostly in the forms of omega-6s and omega-3s. The ratio should be 2 to 1, twice as many omega-6s as omega-3s. But unfortunately, most of us regularly consume 20 to 30 times more omega-6s than 3s. And when it's unbalanced like this, it can be really unhealthy for our brains. Some good sources of omega-3s are flax seeds, hemp hearts, chia seeds, walnuts, soybeans, and wheat germ. Another great source of omega-3s is algae. I take this algae oil supplement, and I'll link it below if you'd like to check it out. Next is protein. There are some excellent sources of plant-based proteins, such as legumes, grains, soybeans, and nuts and seeds. Actually, all plant-based foods contain some protein. Some veggies have an impressive amount, like watercress, alfalfa sprouts, spinach, bok choy, asparagus, mustard greens, collard greens, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and cauliflower. Next is carbs. Our brains run on glucose. It's the main source of fuel. Yes, it can run on ketones, but according to these very, very smart scientists, it is the exception, not the rule, and our brain runs best on glucose. She recommends some great sources of complex carbs and starches with a lot of fiber, such as sweet potatoes with the skins on, berries, winter squash, legumes, lentils, beans, and whole grains. Antioxidants from foods, not supplements, are important to our brains too. Eating a diet rich in antioxidants can help protect our brains from oxidative stress. In particular, vitamin E and C are the body's main antioxidant defenders. We can get these from almonds, flax, citrus, berries, and a variety of veggies. There are some lessons to be learned from the world's healthiest diets, and Dr. Mascani summarizes some of the benefits and what helps them to be so healthy. Whole, nutrient-dense foods, wild, fresh greens, fresh fruit, berries, coffee, red wine, limited red wine, green tea, walnuts, whole grains, beans, and starches, sweet potatoes in particular. Eating a healthy diet can help us to keep our brains healthy and help us to manage our symptoms from those pesky lesions. To see a full video on brain food, watch this video next. 
And until next time, be well. <laughs>